Good evening. My name is Thomas Gedkins, and as um, the director of the Getty Research Institute, it is my great uh, privilege and pleasure to introduce the speaker of today's evening. Um, Professor Kurt Forster was one of my predecessors as director of the GRI. In fact, he was the, in bold, predecessor because he founded this great institution. Kurt, you don't make it easy to introduce you as I find myself in the difficult situation of either taking most of your speaking time to introduce you or having to shorten substantially the details of your outstanding career and accomplishments, which are in fact quite fascinating, a f quite fascinating topic. Professor Forster started his career in Europe at the University of Zurich, Berlin, Munich, the Warburg Institute in London. Before graduating in Zurich, he taught then from 1960 to 67 at Yale, then in Berkeley, then Stanford, MIT, then back to Zurich, so a very calm career. From 1975 to 78, he was director of the Swiss Institute in Rome, and then from 1980 of the Stanford Study Center in Berlin. This astonishing international academic career led in 1984 to his appointment as the founding director of the Getty Center for the History of Art and the Humanities, later to become the Getty Research Institute. In 1992, he left California to become chair of the Department of Art History and Architecture at the Federal Institute of Technology in Zurich. In 1998, he moved to Canada, a country he left out until then, <laughs> to become the director of the Canadian Center of Architecture. His academic career continues as Kurt Forster has been teaching for many years now at the architectural school at Yale, where he still teaches now. It is impossible to just mention the most important publication, but let me name the fields of his wide interest. Kurt Forster started as a scholar of Italian Renaissance art and architecture moving more and more into history of architecture and architectural theory up to contemporary times. He wrote about Palladio, Schinkel, Le Corbusier, Mies van der Rohe, collaborated closely with architects like Tyrannis, Scarpa, Rossi, Gehry, Eisenman, Liebeskind, Herzog de Moran, and others. And of course, I have to mention Richard Meyer, as Kurt was instrumental in collaborating with him on the Getty Center. I will not mention the many honors and honorary doctorates awarded to, to a scholar of such distinction, but let me end by making two additional remarks. First, Professor Forst is one of the very few scholars who, besides their outstanding careers as a teacher and researcher, is able to inspire a discipline. In this case, the history of art. Gifted by an unusual temperament, intelligence and memory, which move him constantly, almost impatiently, to look beyond the usual production of art historical knowledge and encourage others to do so. And second, only few scholars have been given the capability to develop visions, which lay the ground for the next generations. The GRI is the result of such a visionary enterprise. Today, we still follow his accomplishment, the creation of an institute, which brings together one of the best libraries in art history, special collections, which contain the rare and unique resources for the study of the history of art in the future, a scholar program which brings together researchers from all over the world and departments that conceive tools 
to advance scholarship in the digital humanities. We are at the GRI still following the goals which he defined as the first director. Professor Forster's lecture today complements the exhibition on view at the GRI Los Angeles, Berlin, Space of Music, curated by Maristella Cachato and Emily Pugh. As you probably already know, today's lecture will be followed on July 19th by a conversation of Kurt Forster and Frank Gehry. And now, please join me in welcoming Professor Kurt Forster. You're too kind, in a sense, as one says, because now that you've given this thumbnail outline of my life, I'm confused myself and wonder how come it took the course that it did. I've never quite understood what it means to be the right man in the right place at the right time. But I found out two things, and that is to be in the right place at the right time may be enough, it makes you the right man. I happened to start my studies in Berlin at the moment that the Philharmonie was being launched and I was here, a great uh, luck and good circumstance, when the Disney Hall project uh, was awarded to Frank Gehry uh, and in a sense that I think uh, uh, is the justification for which I responded with such uh, enthusiasm to uh, Thomas Gedkin's invitation to speak on these, on, on ch chiefly the uh, Philharmonie. Of course, it's very curious that cities could be related to one another in very special ways, almost like individuals, <clears throat> and that this can be due to a single building. And indeed, as you probably know, certainly from seeing the wonderful cabinet uh, exhibition uh, in the center about uh, Disney Hall and the Philharmonie, uh, how in fact uh, uh, such buildings can carry infinitely more in terms of meaningful connections than one uh, would expect to be possible. Late in a life of upheaval, after years of clandestine work and important competitions lost, the architect Hans Scharoun accomplished the improbable. He designed a new concert hall for one of Europe's great orchestras, the Berliner Philharmonica. In a city still deeply scarred by bombardment and split by Cold War politics, a youthful Willy Brandt um, at, the, at the podium uh, for the inauguration, um, a youthful Willy Brandt presided at the foundation. Halfway through construction, the East German government erected the Berlin Wall and at its inauguration, 1963, Konrad Adenauer resigned as Chancellor of Germany. So that gives you a kind of capsule or perimeter of these extraordinary uh, years that seem uh, to have had consequences far beyond that moment. In the course of six years, Berlin turned into an anomaly and the Philharmonie into a rallying point for the survival of its culture. The reactions to the new building were mixed, but its sheer existence stirred the minds of numerous architects and musicians. In fame and controversy, Frank Gehry's Disney Hall is a true descendant of Sharoon's Philharmonie, and that is probably uh, more readily visible in the competition entry of 1989 rather than in the final work. Gehry openly acknowledges that it was the path-breaking Philharmonie that enabled him to craft his own work for Los Angeles, which 
in its first iteration that you see still resembled its model more uh, readily. Most importantly, Sharoon and Gary share a deep-seated affinity with art and music, and both cultivated formative friendships with artists. Today, the controversies surrounding these concert halls have given way to worldwide recognition. And beyond revolutionizing the very idea of what a concert hall might be, they persist as landmarks and sites of collective enjoyment. They continue to shine consigning to oblivion what went on before they appeared on the scene and stole the show. And the story does not end there, for the recent completion of the Elb Philharmonie in Hamburg carries the energy of Sharoon's idea to new heights with an extravagance that even outdoes Gary's uh, at the multiple of the cost, needless to say. And Gary, has, of course, in turn designed Boulez Hall, a small concert venue in Berlin. Hans Scharoun was born in 1893 and died in 1972. Serving in the First World War and suffering Nazi proscription throughout the years of the regime, only to be caught in the breach between the Western Allies and the Soviets in the partition of Germany after the war. As an architect without a diploma, Sharoon was effectively kept from building a coherent career. And while he did win important competitions after the war, he was prevented from seeing them through to construction. For instance, at Kassel, he took first prize for a new theater in 1952, only to see a local architect snatch the commission away and replace Sharoon's visionary proposal with a banal design of its own, which extends well beyond the building, by the way, spreading its plight, right? To understand Sharoon's talents and abilities, we need look at the company he kept wherever he went. After the First World War, he joined the group of Brunertaut's Gläserne Kette, opened an office in Insterburg, now Cherniakovsk in Russia, and then in the Silesian city of Breslau or Rocklo. He also assumed responsibilities at the Technical University of Breslau in 1925. And I have to emphasize that far from a provincial town, Breslau had come a long way. And I can add, from my own experience, has managed to recapture some of its earlier momentum in recent years after suffering near total destruction um, by the advancing Red Army in 1945. A thumbnail sketch of new architecture in Breslau during the first decades of the 20th century captures a city in the process of modernizing itself. In 1913, the Jahrhunderthalle, the, the hall of the century was inaugurated and uh, kept Breslau on the map for decades, an enormous assembly hall matching structural economy with a dramatic interior of vaguely Piranesian cast. The architect Hans Pölzig had preceded the event with a looming department store, seems straight out of an expressionist film set, building um, with a department store building. And after the war, of course, he did gain fame with sets for expressionist films, such as The Golem of 1920, and the spectacular, and this is relevant here, Cinema Capitol in Berlin in 1924, in which the blazing lights of a huge crystal cap the hall. 
Breslau went on to attract such department stores as Schokens and thereby acquired one of the early branded buildings by Erich Mendelssohn. And you found them in all the major German cities, always distinguished by a particular architectural cast uh, that he, Mendelssohn had conceived exclusively for Schoken. His reputation rested on a building whose fluid contours and scientific purpose, of course, had come to everyone's attention. The Einstein Tower in Potsdam, sharing its sculpted masses with such buildings as the young, very young Hugo Herring's projects, this is actually for a farm, uh, and very soon then with Sharoon's own plans. Breslau's location on the Oder River offers classic prospects. Its millennial history embedded in its churches and its town hall, its police headquarters, the building here uh, uh, below, uh, rising in dark clinker bricks and ample parks and boulevards lend an air of modernity. In the 1920s, Breslau saw young artists, dancers, musicians, develop distinctly avant-garde work, stimulated by such teachers as the dancer Mary Wigman, the former head of the uh, theater department at the Bauhaus, Oskar Schlemmer, on the right-hand side, and uh, rather unusual figures like the mime and painter Alexander Camaro. On the left of the screen, one should add the sculptor Bernhard Heiliger and others, whose name will all reappear later. In fact, Camaro was Alfons Komarowski, a Breslau native who morphed his name into Camaro and as a maverick dancer and painter, literally managed to sidestep tightening Nazi censorship by going underground, only to surface after the war in Berlin, where he collaborated again with Sharoon on several projects, as did, of course, others from the Breslau Circle of Friends, as soon as the Philharmonie got underway. So if it appears as if all of these isolated and disjointed moments dot in a picture far different, of course, uh, from what followed after the war, it was through the Philharmonie that magnetically all these figures are drawn back together. One could say that Sharoon may have long left Breslau behind, but that the life of the city stayed with him, as did his closest associates from the 1920s, including some of his earliest clients. This is worth mentioning for other than only biographical reasons to, to complete the picture, for this hints at the curious untimeliness of Sharoon's post-war work. Indulging in a bit of exaggeration, one might think of the Philharmonie as a revenant of what made the 1920s such a staggering time of invention, despair, and desire. Only in the late 1950s was Sharoon able to bring to fruition what had been repressed during the regime and the immediate post-war period. To fathom the nature of his imagination, let's return therefore one last time to Breslau. Following the lead of Stuttgart's Weissenhof Siedlung on your left of 1927, Breslau held a comparable exhibition in 1929. And even today, you won't have any trouble singling out Sharoon's contribution in both at, uh, I'm sorry, uh, at uh, Stuttgart, it is this 
dramatic curving stairwell which takes shape on the outside of the building, uh, breaking the compulsory regularity of the Bauhaus that dominates the rest of the development. And uh, at, at Breslau here, similarly, he proposed bachelor quarters laid out on an S-shaped plan holding the split-level apartments together by generous communal spaces, indoor-outdoor areas, and balconies that protect, of course, the privacy of occupants. The soundness of this project is borne out by its recent transformation into a hotel. It was, in fact, its social, even one might say its intimate, uh, character that attracted the interest of a factory owner in the town of Lebau in the Lausitz. Mr. Schminke is likely to have detected this particular vein, this generous, not to say almost luxurious quality latent in Sharun's building when he asked him to design a villa that's located between a pasta factory behind and a miniature landscape with a pond at its center. And thereby Villa Schminke achieves a sort of dynamic conjunction of wide open floors, terraces, fluid indoor spaces with an inventive landscape surrounding it, held together by flights of stairs that lead to observation points and coalesce around an indoor hall, House Schminke matches almost palatial dimensions with meticulous attention to detail. Please do subtract the black uh, uh, rug. It's uh, not a um, homage to Malievich. It is a modern convenience that has been put in. However, to the uh, relief, this is a pretty rainy part of, uh, of uh, southeastern uh, uh, Germany, um, uh, you can, for a small contribution, stay the night and have the run of the villa. Um, and that's when I took my picture. So do subtract the black centering um, rug and you will begin to understand, as you will with other pictures, that indeed the entire villa has never come to rest at any one point in this fashion. It mimics to one side the elegant profile of an ocean liner and the protective intimacy behind of a greenhouse that you capture easily in the picture. The naval imagery, of course, so dear to modernists of Corbusian persuasion is largely symbolic, but it actually helps to tie together the complex distribution of rooms in a house whose scale is almost impossible to pin down. It is only when you touch a handle, when you close the window, that in a sense you know that you are from your own bodily presence in a contact and therefore lend a scale to what is around you. Then you step outside and the, the wide reach of the landscape envelops you no less than down the hall Every, the handle to every movable um, uh, suspended drawer and so forth uh, is at your beck and call. Depending on where you stand or where you move, it feels grand or intimate, rising from its sight or discreetly making room as if stepping aside, surprising with a succession of long and near views, half transparent, reflective surfaces, etched discs or, or um, glass uh, that both shields and invites uh, uh, the viewer, gives uh, along with eminently practical details, operable windows, shielded niched lights and so forth, that extraordinary quality of refinement uh, that is otherwise um, not apparent in its general plan and execution. Circular openings, discs etched on glass, an elusive depth is 
added to the planar emphasis of so much architecture of the time. And while most of these elements that you could pick out, you might find in many other buildings of the time, their peculiar array and their interaction uh, in your own uh, perception and movement through the house um, is probably uh, a virtually unique phenomenon. So these qualities, as obvious as they may be today, at the time impressed Hertha Hammerbacher, the landscape architect on site, who with her husband, Hermann Matern, promptly became Sharun's next clients. An eminent critic of the day, Adolf Bene, published the small house that Sharun designed for the Materns after the Schminke Villa. And while the sky was rapidly darkening under Nazi, the Nazi regime, Bene still managed to illustrate his article with photographs purposely taken to best effect. You'll see some others. They illustrate what Bene found particularly laudable in Sharun's design, namely, and I quote Bene, the house's stance to the world, as it were, the way the house behaves to what is outside, he perceived to be profoundly sympathetic, especially for, and he goes on, the play of light and shade that extends deeply inside, where things are seen intersecting and reflecting one another in an atmosphere of serenity. This he published as late as 1935 in the Deutsche Bauzeitung, where these crappy illustrations come from. But uh, there is a photograph on the left which shows the front of the house that you can see a little better. Um, but, and this article by Bene amounts to what the Germans call an Ehrenrettung, a plea for recognition, exonerating, as it were, the architect who by this time had fallen under a, a professional prescription. Uh, but unfortunately, it was to no avail. Bene had been a pioneering figure with his book on the modern functional building in 1926 but his opinions no longer counted for much in the advancing 1930s. Still, his book again regained a place in post-war thinking about architecture, and that prompted me to include in the series of texts and documents uh, a series of books published at the Getty Research Institute to include it in translation. Bene argued, this is long before I had any idea I was going to come here and would be able to remind you of it. Bene argued that while modern functional buildings were obviously governed uh, by technological and economic imperatives, the role of architectural imagination, this is his term, was by no means banished from them. One of the greatest challenges, Bene argued, resides precisely in a dilemma that is all too easily evaded by capitulating to external constraints at the expense of any emotional quality and public impact in the result. Such strictures lead, and so he argued at the time, led to impoverishment. And he warned that this impoverishment is not restricted to um, lean structures, but even luxurious buildings suffer from it because it stifles any immediate connection with the body and lacks the quality of vicarious life. So it's worth remembering that two of Sharun's colleagues, Schlemmer and his friend Camaro, you saw them in Breslau, dedicated their life to dance and to forging a close connection between abstract shapes, moving figures, and music. And these interests had been, had been nourished um, at Hellerau, a Dresden suburb, where, where two Genevan teachers, Emile Jacques Dalcroz, taught modern dance, and Adolphe Appia, scenography. 
I'm glad to point out another important Getty connection, namely it was the Getty Conservation Institute that is essentially responsible and directed in large measure transformation of the Red Army Officers Club that had occupied uh, the center and bring it back to its uh, uh, state, original state and its current state. So from Breslau to Berlin, Sharoon shared the public's fascination with modern dance and the even broader popularity of film and music. It stirred his imagination when he later set to work um, uh, on generous public venues and sites of collective experience. Here is one of uh, Adolf Appiah's um, Adolf Appiah's uh, uh, stage designs and Jacques Dalcroix's um, training handbook for uh, the uh, enactment of certain musical phrases that you can see here notated into, um, in, into dance uh, uh, positions and, 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 and movements. Uh, of course, the young architects from Berlin uh, were all flocking to Hellerau, half of the married dancers, as Mies van der Rohe did. Um, and so maybe that connection between Appiah and Mies is not entirely due to feminine attraction. From one of his clients, Sharoon came to know about state-sponsored colossal works, such as the uh, automotive highways or autobahnen, when he planned that very modest house near Potsdam uh, that we've already looked at, the Matern House. Sharoon designed it for the landscape architect and his wife that he got to know on the Schminke uh, building site. Matern had been tasked with embellishing the endless miles of dreary shoulders along the Autobahnen for the Organisation Tot. But when it came to his private domain, Matern wished to spend his time on intimate terms with the landscape of Brandenburg, that's right, taken from the back of the house in Bornim, rather than smoothing over rough edges along the motorways. Sharoon catered to his client's desire with such appealing ideas as a built-in sofa that prolongs the curving landforms inside the house and captures in an analogy to a photographic camera the vivid adumbrations of its surroundings. Here is, is, is that sofa and look how even the radiators and the shadows and the inside outside relationship where those little discs reappear and the light from both sides filtered and captured turn the living space into a kind of habitable photographic camera which Bene so eloquently described. Now these qualities inform a um, rare wall painting inside, here is that uh, uh, oculus, that round window, uh, and this wall painting was a clandestine product by another artist um, at the Matern House, uh, likewise branded a non-person, Oskar Schlemmer, of the erstwhile Bauhaus and a sometime Breslau colleague of Sharoon's, who also worked on other projects for the Materns when both of them were sidelined um, uh, by the regime. Now, in their collaboration on the Matern House, real affinities begin to emerge between Sharoon and Schlemmer. Here, I, I always like to juxtapose things which are of such categorical a distinction in scale and purpose as to suggest that there may be nothing to really hold them tight. But in fact, if you look at, at the Schlemmers' Ex Libris, um, and you see its uh, extraordinary, uh, extraordinary flexing of lines as if the pen were um, carving out on the surface the volumes that it designates, you cannot help considering a rapport of this in the lineaments of a plan like the Breslau housing that, um, uh, that um, uh, we've looked at. Although the time of Sharoon and, uh, uh, and, um, 
and uh, Schlemmer in, in Breslau was very short. It seems fitting to consider them the Breslau exponents, in fact, of a new approach to space and movement. They sought to stir space into a powerful emotional experience rather than consider it a geometric abstraction. When he had just arrived at the Bauhaus in September 1922, Schlemmer expressed his hope that it would be dance to provide a dynamic impetus for renewal, and he said via form, color, and movement. He argued that elementary forms, such as straight lines, as we've seen, diagonal circles, ellipses, will, by their necessary connections, give rise to a dance that is in accord with its origin, Dionysian and pure feeling, but also Apollinian in its finite form and a symbol of mediation between polarities. So polarities had indeed taken hold of the real world and could not be disregarded, especially when they burst, as they often did, into violent release and action. Whether acted out or not, they call for a dynamic correspondence and an ultimate reversal, an umpolung or energetic reversal, as the cultural historian Abi Warburg detected in the innermost workings of the psyche. It may amount perhaps to a little more than a footnote, but it is worth remembering that the Weimar Bauhaus already had the singer Gertrude Gruno on its faculty as a master in charge of what, you might wonder, the Bauhaus, well, Harmonisierungslehre. Uh, I don't think that's maintained a footing in the curriculum. It may not be obvious what this discipline taught by a singer with the help of dance steps and color charts. And here you can read probably Gruno's far cries because um, Gertrude Gruno tried to combine motion, position, color, shape, and sound. Um, Therefore, she basically taught with the help of dance steps and color charts, which are still being used in this configuration. Um, uh, it tried uh, to uh, instruct colleagues and students in how to harmonize things, to overcome that polarization, which was recognized by everybody, of course. Uh, how? Well, by fine-tuning the relationship among color, form, and sound. Now, what Schlemmer had hoped to accomplish with colors, movement, shapes, and sound in his triadic ballet, Sharoon pursued with his long meditation on buildings that could never hope of, seeing, uh, of being built. I apologize for just, uh, um, a, a, by way of suggestion, uh, a brief look into the considerable collection of drawings where you can see, in fact, uh, two in this exhibition, uh, rare and unique to my uh, knowledge, the first time that some of these works are actually shown in the context of Sharon's architecture in this country. In the little exhibition, uh, these uh, meditations on um, uh, buildings uh, th that, uh, by any stretch of the imagination, would be beyond uh, their time. His watercolors of public halls and arenas in the shape of giant grottos and eerie mountaintops, of course, on the one hand, recall Mendelssohn, again, Mendelssohn above, Sharoon below, uh, uh, and also, they uh, go to Bruno Tauts, visionary architecture in the Alps, as well as uh, recall some sublime arenas for collective gatherings invented uh, by others. Nor do they hark back to the Jahrhunderthalle, you've seen it, and its overpowering size, but bear instead a distinctly utopian imprint unconcerned with pragmatic constraints and technological considerations that Eric Mendelssohn rarely overlooked in his projects, whether built 
uh, such as the Einstein Tower, or visionary and speculative, as were his giant factories, for instance, the one in the upper image. Uh, another element from Tout also lingered in Sharun's imagination. The utopia of thousands gathering peacefully under the auspices of a benign collectivity, by contrast to the ever more rabble-rousing Volksversammlungen that erupted in the late years of the Weimar Republic. Such a realm of joy of elation may have found its epoch-making release, of course, in Beethoven's Ode to Joy, which, I should add, became a sort of torch song uh, of Berlin at more recent world historical moments. If Schlemmer had to work within the confines of the stage and the bounds of abstraction, Sharun fully projected his ideas into a society that seemed to have vanished altogether from the earth during the long and gruesome years of the war when he did most of these drawings. No sooner was Berlin jointly occupied by the Allies that the staggering problems of its reconstruction called for a plan to turn its carcass into a city. Sharun was the man of the hour and for a brief time his team mapped out hitherto an unimagined future. And he certainly shows that resolve and vigor, that kind of pent-up burst of energy uh, with a cocky position of the pipe alone as if he were a sort of drum major of the new architecture after the war. But before the Soviet sector definitely veered off from Allied administration, he launched his concept in the summer of 1946, exhibited in, exhibiting, I'm sorry, inside the uh, ruin of the Schloss, wouldn't they be happy they had it back, programmatically titled, and you see just one shot inside, Berlin built a first report. Sharun conceived of a peaceful future, but hatched in the old, but uh, one hatched in the old lair of the dragon, so to speak. The moment was not favorable. Sharun's concept of an urban archipelago emerging from a sea of rubble found few followers and scant political support. This is what is in, known in Berlin, and once you've looked at it, probably for you too, the dog's head, the Hundekopf, which describes the perimeter of the uh, city of Berlin as it was then organized uh, in terms of transportation. Here is the Brandenburg Gate, unter den Linden, here is the island of the Schloss, just to give you um, an idea. And uh, what Sharun had in mind was, in fact, to design a completely different town from the one that um, uh, he found. Um, but it, was, it received barely more than a decent funeral. Two long housing blocks, however, part of that plan, and when you see only this little fragment, you're probably going to recognize what was intended, were constructed behind the Stalin Allee in 1947. And so, of course, there's no uh, problem of knowing where they come from, right? This is Mies van der Rohe and the Stuttgart exhibition with these Laubengangheuser and different entrances and alcoves, the use of color, extremely modest. It's this block here, very soon to be completely obliterated by the Stalin Allee, which was constructed in front of it, still standing today, actually. So by 1948, when the Soviet sector formally split from the western parts of Berlin under joint allied administration, the notion of an urban archipelago was quietly abandoned. It may have been a pipe dream, but the concept was bound to surface again uh, when the problems of shrinking cities and the rebuilding of devastated towns need to be addressed. In a word, Sharun thought of large green swaths 
to marble the formerly dense city territory that had long been described as das Steinerne Berlin, a city of stone or rather brick, with dark and narrow courtyards lining overcrowded tenements. To be sure, much of the old Berlin had been smashed by years of aerial bombardment and plowed under by Russian artillery. Sharun's idea set, to, set a powerful polemic charge of its own, but it never went off. Much of West Berlin, by contrast to the model adopted in the East, of course, rose over existing foundations and produced what came to be known as the German post-war reconstruction to Kur. Sharun would have none of it. And wherever he designed residential buildings and schools, schools in particular, he started from the assumption that his first concern was with the land, with the reappropriation, the reintegration of liberated territory and of buildings that are capable of interacting with one another, as they indeed do in the school in Marl. Typically, a public school became a miniature town for kids an assembly hall with a local theater, a kind of indoor-outdoor park, and finally, for the Philharmonie, a sort of Stadtkrone, as Bruno Taut would have called it, a new centerpiece for Berlin. How, one may ask, did he achieve this? As chance would have it, Charun's inaugural sketch, which you can see in the exhibition, another a um, fantastic moment, in fact, uh, survives. Although the hall's location was not yet definite, its nature as a magnet was never in doubt. There's a plan above and a section below, rapidly drawn in colored pencil, outline a building with most of its distinctive features already in place, but with none of the details nor the expected precision. The sketch implies what can be definite without being precise, comprehensive without any detail, and ultimately grand on a very small scale. The idea sketch exercises a power of its own throughout the process of giving definition step by step to a very complex building. From the start, Bundles of lines give resonance to the static parts that provis they provisionally represent. And out of their blur emerge the contours of an idea as had never been proposed before. For those who have not experienced the Philharmonie, uh, and for those who have, of course, I uh, would like to convey something of the intrigue and pleasure I have enjoyed many, many times. As you approach the area, usually in the evening and often in winter, you're likely to catch a glimpse of the building's profile above the treetops of the Tiergarten. The twin peaks of the roof, solidly outlined during the day and subtly underscored at night by hidden lights, trace something does not exist in Berlin or any place nearby, the profile of a mountain. Now, profiles of mountains and how they could conceivably have come about was something that preoccupied many in the early 19th century. So Schinkel, uh, the architect of Berlin, and I'm sorry, was uh, uh, retracing a whole sheet with different profiles, and this is one of them. Uh, of course, the father of modern geology, Charles Lyell, in his principles, illustrated uh, various instances how, through the folding of the crust of the earth, you get this particular profile, which, as a result of upheaval of the mass and the consequent erosion, the surfaces produces exactly this um, uh, profile. Thus forewarned, as it were, we're not surprised to step onto a pavement um, of heavy slabs of different, you can see that 
uh, here, both inside and out, unfortunately, most of the outside has been destroyed, but inside you can still see it, the heavy slabs of stone, of different types of stone that extend through the entire building. This was Hermann Matern's contribution to the project. As one enters deep into the structure and deposits one's wardrobe at the back of a kind of grotto under a massive volume towering overhead, one reaches the inside of the mountain one saw from afar. Around the hull of the hall that visitors scale over bifurcating stairs, crossing bridges, ascending along platforms, and finally approaching the doorways leading um, to their seats. Uh, it can, it's very difficult to illustrate uh, at all, even in photographs. You, you, you have to go through this particular process, which, by the way, is of disarming simplicity in the end uh, when you come to know the hall. Now, as um, visitors leave the canyon of this foyer behind, a stunning inside, here is this, you see this with uh, people in it, which makes all the difference, um, Bernhard Heiliger sculpture on the way, uh, they finally uh, come, you see on top, to this extraordinary, stunning hall that opens in all directions at once because all the imaginary landscape features that are already behind them as they have reached their seats return. But in a sudden reversal, again the umpolung if you want, enormous hollows where there were solids, inviting slopes in the place of austere cliffs. Sharun knew what he was talking about when he compared the terraced seating to vineyards. And I deliberately put uh, a, a German vineyard. I'm, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm doing something wrong. Um, uh, this is um, uh, in the Saale River Valley, and of course this is under World Monument Protection on the Lake of Geneva. As you can see, and so between the two of them, they give you the story of the vineyard. Segmented and interlocking, the blocks of seats are all similar and different, like the pieces of a puzzle jaggedly arrayed around an orchestra that is not in a pit, but on a promontory. It is here that the idea of quasi-equidistant seats in all directions was born. The hall remotely recalls a tent, mind you, with no poles, and allows for as many different experiences as there are listeners. Instead of ideal seats and cheap ones, all are democratically different, acknowledging the differ that difference may have many reasons, external as well as private, perceptual as well as imaginary. If the old shoebox hall tends to hang music like heavy drapes over the listeners, the Philharmonie, if you allow the expression, hangs the score like fresh wash into the air, and fresh it is in its transparency rather than the heavy brocade of old. Naturally, the parkour that led you from the city to your seat is traveled once more in reverse. After the concert, the public descends zigzagging stairs, moves along parapets, captures glimpses of colored glass by Camaro on the left, and uh, this is the colored glass in the library across the street, another work by Sharoon. They cross the pavement, um, they have come over, dispersed back into the city, catching perhaps a last glance of those peaks above the pitch dark trees and possibly a sliver of the moon. In parting, Let's recognize the Philharmonie's unique standing among post-war concert halls. The others are the Sydney Opera and the Philips Pavilion at the Brussels World's Fair in 1958. Neither is easily categorized. All three were expected to serve traditional auditory purposes 
stimulate new visual and spatial experiences and engender the sense of community attuned to them. The degree of novelty in their shape and role reflects an adventurous projection into a future many believed to be near. If we consider them in light of these criteria, we might place the Sydney Opera first in its role as a harbour landmark, and thereby a whole city's and indeed a continent's landmark. Whereas the Phillips Pavilion claims recognition for its futuristic blend of images, animation, sound molded into an engulfing experience, wonderful documentation by the Dutch engineer of the company here at the Getty Research Institute, including the colored glass through which light was projected onto this mysterious narration which has everything from dinosaurs to contemporary uh, uh, African landscapes in it. The, um, uh, the Sh Sharun, what Sharun accomplished in Berlin reaffirms most of all the importance of architecture for the city. And an architecture which is both eminently present in the city as a landmark and unique in its own interior character. He scores on all three points at once. The Philharmonie provides a setting for musical life, an artificial landscape in midst the flat and vacant cityscape, revolutionizes the public ritual and collective experience of music, not least of contemporary music. Finally, the building leaves typological constraints behind and has in turn, of course, engendered others and that's why we concern ourselves with the hall as the progenitor of Disney Hall here. The dubious sobriquet Circus Karayani, which is Karayan here, the end, reveals, uh, or rather perhaps contains, we might say, a kernel of truth. The Philharmonie is an arena in which everyone can devote themselves to what humans are uniquely capable of accomplishing. I'm sure you wonder what that is. Well, pure enjoyment of their native ability to experience the world in form, color, movement, and sound. Thank you. Um. Are there any questions? <laughs> There's one. I was wondering if you have seen the ad for the National Rifle Association. I'm sorry, the ad for what? Uh, sorry. Uh, oh, I'm sorry, I, it's very hard to hear. It's not actually a rock concert, but it's the same problem that they. <laughs> this week, the NRA. The National Rifle Association yeah. put out an ad. Have you seen it? With Frank Erie's Disney Hall in it. No. No, that I haven't seen. I've seen another advertisement a few years ago made by the uh, Philharmonie where the building is placed in various alpine settings on Austrian lakes and so forth where you can see the real mountains behind it. So, in other words, it's... The, now, now, what the hell did they do there? I mean, they were using Disney Hall as a symbol of the left-wing ideology of um, oh. Hollywood and uh -huh. its negative influence on the Yeah, country. well, they must have recognized something in it. Are conceived 
for a certain acoustic experience. There is no such thing as good or bad acoustics. Um, in, 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 for instance, if your if your repertoire is chiefly 19th century symphonic music, uh, you want it to be velvety, golden, bronze, brush surface, you know that that uh, goes by your ears as a kind of a phenomenal stream filled with uh, with with burgundy wine or with, uh, <laughs> topped with uh, all sorts of uh, all sorts of things. What should be? Um, you know that saturated. You know where the music is a, is a wave that carries you away. If you want to listen to Debussy, La Mer doesn't do the same thing at all. Boulez is Assis or something like that, even less. There, you want in a sense to have a landscape experience where certain instruments seem infinitely remote. Others are, are, are quivering by at your feet. Others are hanging like sheets in the air. That's why I made the comparison that if Boulez did a piece in uh, Disney Hall, which I've heard more than once, you have the impression he's hanging his score into the air, and it's hanging there. Uh, whereas uh, if you would have uh, Brahms or so, it would really be something that sweeps by, that covers you, that washes over you. So the acoustics are extremely different in both instances. Uh, some uh, have uh, very short and others have longer resonance, that's a key thing. There is a particular range of resonance which gives that saturated sound, as opposed to the other idea like Debussy, uh, where you would have a kind of pointillistic sound, very many sound particles dispersed in your air, a totally different uh, auditory experience. And the great thing is, of course, that you can say with the uh, music of the 20th century that this is good or that is bad or this is necessarily the way it would be ideally be or only the way you experience it in the whole. It is literally democratic in the sense that, as I suggested, the whole provides a different auditory experience to everyone sitting in it. Um, rather than to collectively wash over uh, the uh, uh, audience. Uh, I, I think actually, one thought, when I did the Biennale in Venice in 2004, I had over 40 concert halls around the world that were under construction uh, at, at that moment. And it seemed to me that this was a great signal that collectivity was uh, widening its attempts, that one was searching for a way of being together in very many without being, as it were, a sledgehammer, you know, into one experience or another. That's a very deep social desire, kind of peaceful, differentiated, and yet focused uh, uh, experience. I, I've always marveled at the fact that there is literally no other way how you can make 2,000 people go totally silent. <laughs> Except at the moment, you know. Um, Um, specifically, uh, as to the acoustics of the Berlin Philharmonic, I'm fascinated by the acoustical clouds that are suspended yeah. above. And I'm just wondering if you are familiar with their origin uh, as to either a contribution by the acoustical engineer yeah. or part of the original uh, no. architectural conception of the sky over the vineyard. <laughs> No, they are there for acoustical purposes. Uh, uh, because you get in these ascending cities, large surfaces at the same stable angle, which has a tendency of focusing sound, throwing it back in one narrow area of the hall. Whereas these are like balancing walls from which the sound is reflected again in a much wider range and avoids uh, this. Uh, disconcerting phenomenon where at one point you hear very little of something and another you hear it redouble in its intensity. It, uh, it, it, it was a problem, uh, the acoustic engineer, um, Kramer, who also was the first acoustic engineer working with Frank Gehry before Toyota came in as a result of Kramer's passing, um, uh, I, I had discussed this with Frank. 
uh, and had uh, given him uh, very, very valuable uh, indications as to how to avoid this one thing, which would be sort of like a hayloft, you know, under one, under one roof. There are many other small, you can't, well, you can see those uh, comical reflectors. They do the same thing. And this has become a very common practice if you go to Lucerne in uh, uh, Jean Nouvel's uh, uh, hall in Lucerne. Uh, the entire wall says it looks like uh, Belgian waffles. Uh, it, it literally, actually, it's the scale of the waffle, it makes it rather well apparent. Uh, uh, anyway, and it can be pivoted. Uh, by pivoting, you can control the length of the resonance. And by the surface, you can uh, make sure that you don't get dead areas or over-focused areas. Of course, in the Rococo, you did that by all the little covering in the foot in the corner. Yeah, and yeah. yeah. uh, maybe for many, many fast little you know, yeah. yeah. That's another question. I have a question regarding your remark at the beginning. Uh, you mentioned that the ethically uh, is superior uh, what is the concept of? Could you clarify, please, why? Uh, I'm, I'm sorry, I have a hard time hearing what. Um, <laughs> uh, so, would you tell me what I've been telling you about why I was superior to the Disney Hall? And could you explain it? Yes? I don't care. I haven't been in the Elf Hall of Harmony and been trying to get in. Thank again, um, Kurt Foster, for a wonderful lecture. 
lively and insightful. And uh, please join us um, for a reception outside with the opportunity to talk to Kurt Foster a little bit more. Thank you for coming tonight. Thank you.